Welcome back everybody. Welcome to YouTube. Welcome to Parity InfoSec. Today we are going to be covering the latest retirement from Hack the Box, Luann. Luann is a little bit of a reference to Lua programming, a lightweight scripting language. Uh, not super familiar with it, but there have been a couple boxes that have had it so far on Hack the Box. So this is just one other application where we're going to try some things out. There's not a lot to this box. It is an easy box, but it's rated super low. I think a 2.4 the last time I checked, and it's mostly because it's a little CTFE. We're gonna have to go out and we're gonna have to find some things, and it's it's not really super realistic. But what you're gonna find are a few new techniques uh, when you're looking for certain things, how to enumerate some of the applications that are in use and see if you can get some tips and hints uh, but for the most part it'll be pretty simple with a browser go buster and burp suite kind of tackle all those in order to uh, get through the http site and then we'll use a little bit of john to craft few passwords and we're in this is a net bsd operating system so there will be a few quirks frankly a lot of quirks as well as we're going over uh, HTML, so there's gonna be some URL encoding issues. We're gonna get through this box through command injection, getting onto the system, and then using some decryption uh, through NetPGP. And then there's no real application that we can use for su or sudo, so we're gonna have to work around that with do as. But other than that, that's everything. There was a really cool application that I built for this one just to test out my capabilities of Python programming a web shell. I'm gonna break that off and put that into a separate video. And I'll go ahead and publish that uh, here in a couple days just to show everybody from a OSCP or more of a uh, AWAE offensive security side of the house or possibly GWAPT, GWAPT, from SANS, these are just more advanced uh, Python programming for HTML dominance. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So we'll kick it off with an end map, 10, 10, 10, 218, and we'll take a look at the ports that come up on this box. Should be fairly simple. Uh, there should be a port 22, uh, port 80, and a port 9001. Typically that's used for Tor. In this case, we can go ahead and run scripts and versions. So run the same thing, SC, SV, and then we'll cut it down to ports 22, 80, and 9001. One thing that it's gonna kick back, and I already mentioned a little bit earlier, is the operating system. Other than just fingerprinting, when it runs a banner grab on port 22 for SSH, it will actually come back and say, this is NetBSD SSH. When it goes to run port 80 HTTP, it's gonna come back a little bit different. It's gonna give us some robots information. And then port 9001 is gonna tell us that it is an HTTP server daemon and not exactly a Tor port, which would typically be what a 9001 is but in this case they're running another http server on 9001 and we're not going to mess with that one that one doesn't have much to do with us so we're going to stick to port 80 and ssh i'm going to go ahead and load up our browser and take a look at 80 while that finishes so 10 10 10 218 turn off my burp real quick I haven't turned it on yet we'll just run it natively and it comes up asking for a username and password the site says and then just dot that's all it says so we can try admin admin test test honestly the password we don't know it yet when I hit cancel it comes back and says 401 unauthorized and we're not authorized to see index.html. It says this is 127.0.0.1 port 3000. Well, 
that's not what we're seeing, but it's pushing us through a redirect on the local host 4218 to port 3000. That's why it says 127.001. A little bit of a quirk. If we were to click on this, it's obviously not going to go anywhere. If we were going to go here and say 3000, it's not going to go anywhere because it's inside. So there's not a whole lot there. We're still waiting on that scan to come back. But like I said, there is a robots file. So we'll just go ahead and do it manually. And when we do that, it says disallow the folder weather uh, with a little note of returning 404, but still harvesting cities. Well, I'm not sure what that means, but let's go ahead and take a look at weather. Comes back with a 404. Sometimes you put another slash at the end that works, not here. So what is going on? My first instinct here is I know that there's a weather folder. There's something inside of it, so I'm going to use GoBuster. This one's still taking an incredible amount of time. So GoBuster, uh, dir, and then we'll give it 10, 10, 10, 218 slash weather slash, and then the word list. I like is opt sec list discovery web content raft large words dot text. So all that is in there. We'll go ahead and run that just the way it is. And we instantly get an answer back and that is forecast. Okay, being that it's weather forecast makes sense. Let's go ahead and look at forecast. So forecast brings us to a page that processes JSON, which is just another mechanism for passing data back and forth. Now it says no city specified, use city equal list to list available cities. So we're going to treat it like a parameter and just say question mark city equals list. And we get a list of cities. Knowing that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say city equals London. And what it does is it kicks back the information. So here's London, the date, the weather, minimum temperature, maximum temperature, pressure, humidity, wind speed, degrees, all that information. And let's go through the 27th, 28th. 20th. So it's going through the, the days coming up for five day forecast. So not too bad, but ultimately, what does that mean for us? You can poke around for a while. Um, we'll go ahead and view source. So view source, it shows you the straight up code, uh, non prettied up, but you're kind of at a stuck point here. If you don't, if you're not really familiar with some of the techniques, here's where I would start looking at how to mess with the parameter. So if this were some kind of local file inclusion, you would just say Etsy host or Etsy password. And unfortunately, this one says unknown city Etsy password. So city doesn't exist. If I put it in over here, uh, it still says it, okay. So there's some error messages we're not gonna be able to see. So I like to stick to view source. I'll make this bigger so that we can mess with this. So, all right, we can't do local file inclusion. Let's try 10, 10, 14, 20, just like that. And it's still treating it like text and not actually running it. So we're not gonna get our remote file inclusion. But we'll go back to London. We know we have a good command there. Uh, let's try two slashes. So knowing that I'm going to come back to my page here and I'm going to start doing a little bit more of this and that is putting some more cheat, sheet, cheat sheets out there. So here's one I started making for Lua 
just some things that I came across on this box. So with comments, they use dash dash to be end of line. If you're going to use block, it's going to be dash dash, and then you're going to put in square brackets for your start and your stop. We're going to come up with this one in a second, which is your quotes. They, they generally use single, but there's double. Obviously, in this case, we're going to be using single for a few things. And then if you're going to chain commands together, they do use the colon in order to separate some of the Lua commands. So with that said, we, we do know that this is a double dash for comment, but it didn't do anything because it's still treating it like text. So just like if you were going to use SQL injection or anything else like that, we're going to try a single. I'll start with a double. So a double is going to be treated like text. And then we'll try going to a single quote. And this is just part of kind of fuzzing for those different injection points. And here we got an error back. So this one says that on line 49 of this user local web API weather.lua, it's attempting to call a nil value. It's trying to go to this London that doesn't exist, but we didn't complete the original command. So we know that we're starting to get some injection point here. I think this is where I want to show. If you go here, you say London, tack dash dash. It's going to come back and it's going to say there's an error parsing the JSON. There's an unexpected character. But the problem isn't with the JSON. When you go down and you actually look at the view source, the JSON error is coming because there's a Lua error back on the server. So this is why I said I want to look at it from view source. So we know that we're starting to get things. And in this one, honestly, it was a lot of playing around. And this is why it got such a bad rap. This is why this box didn't get a lot of good ratings. I'm going to put in a semicolon. Like I said, that is a way to divide two different commands. And I'm still getting an error. We'll go ahead and put this into, well, let's say, parentheses. So here we actually got it to complete the command, kind of, because it's still saying I can't find London. And because that happened because there's other parameters that we have commented out. So we got it to execute code without erroring and faulting out, but it didn't er execute its normal code. What kind of code can we make it do? And this just comes back to learning how to use Lua. So I'm just going to go to Lua Basics. And we're going to go to the most basic thing, which is print. And I just want to check the syntax, so it's just going to be simple. Print, inside parentheses, we're going to put double quotes, and we're going to print what we want to print. So here, after the semicolon, we'll say print. Put those in there. Double, hello. Actually, we'll just call this parity. That way I know it's me. And then I'll go ahead and put a semicolon just in case. Run it. Looks a little bit the same, but what you really have to pay attention to is it's right there, but it's still giving the first part of the 500 error. I'm going to show you a cool little trick here. So if you're not familiar with how to use burp really well, uh, I am sure that Zap does this as well. Uh, I'm going to try and show you through burp a little trick where you would replace the text and it will get that out of the way before we see it every time. So I'm going to turn off my intercept and I'm going to come over to options. Inside of options you can set all your different proxy listeners, you can set different intercept rules, but here we want to come lower down where it's match and replace. And here you can match or replace so much information. They come with defaults for user agents and things like that. But I'm going to add one. And what we want to do is we want to look at the response body. The error message that we're getting is coming back in the response. It's not in the message that we're sending over. So we're going to take the response body. I'm going to copy this command all the way up to there. Because that is going to be in the beginning of everything that we send. I'll put it in here, and then I want it to replace it with nothing. So I'm going to leave it blank. Just delete. 
So it's in there and it's checked now. My intercept is off. So if I come back in here and I say parity uh, infosec, when I run it this time, you can see that all the data was stripped off the front end. And now I have essentially a web shell where I can do things. Like I said, there's going to be a part two to this video where I actually turn this into a Python script with a prompt and it was actually a lot of fun, but it's, it's one of those critical skills you're going to want to know for AWAE, the offensive securities web pen testing, as well as some of the SANS pen testing stuff for uh, their web app pen test certification. Lua is a different language for me, but just in line with the print, there's some other nifty little things that you can learn about Lua. And usually it's the first thing you want to do is figure out how you can execute code. So see if it lets you execute. Aside from looking through every single one of these, the answer that we're looking for is os.execute. It's a system call. They are not making this easy to find. So here it is os.execute. And then you can run whatever commands you want to run. If you want to append anything, so like here they're showing, if you pass me a directory name, this function creates a directory. It's going to execute make directory. And then the dot dot appends dir name. Sometimes it's a plus, sometimes it's a single dot. In this case, it's a double dot. I'm not trying to write any kind of script right now, but I am going to take advantage of the OS execute. So OS execute, and we'll just give it a simple host name. And when I execute it, we are luan.hdb. So we are getting our remote code execution. Let's see, who am I? I am underscore HTTPD, but that's only getting me so far. We've replaced the text in the proxy options, so this will just keep going on and on and on. Let's see what kind of commands are out there. One that I like to run is which. Um, in this case, I'll do which which, and I get nothing back. If I say which uh, sh. That one's a pretty good indicator that it doesn't have the function which, because I'm sure it has the function sh. Let's we'll see what happens when we say env. So it only gives us the first line when we make that command to environmental variables. So that's an unfortunate limitation. But now we got to figure out how we're going to get something if not a reverse shell. Uh, I was going through a CBT, a computer-based training uh, on Linux administration this week and it seemed like such a simple thing but I'm so used to using a locate that I don't use find as much and find had a really basic command uh, that I tried out on this box and I thought it was kind of interesting. I know it sounds simple. Find slash is the location and then if you don't put anything it will send you back everything. So on this box, because we're not able to easily move around in it, we're not able to get more than that first line, I was able to do this and get fine, and now we can run through all the files that are available for our user to look at. Kind of a nifty, nifty kind of duh. Not a hard trick, but it was something where I could go, okay, I don't know what's sitting in these files. I don't know what applications I'm able to run. Let's see, is there which? No. Oh, there is. It's in user bin which, which tells me it's probably not in the path. 
So uh, I'm actually going to copy this because I, I want to keep this file open. Run new tab. And in here we'll say user bin which user bin which uh, sh and it's still not giving it to us wow all right it's a little odd but for right now we know that we can do certain things so obviously we know we got host name to work it's in here somewhere that previous one um, let's see if we can get a net stat to come out so net stat ants and here's all the ports so we can see they are running on port 3000 um, but you can also see that this is our connection which is 14.20 connecting into 218 on port 80 and then you can see 3000 is talking to 3000 here it's two port the same port kind of going back and forth there's also a 3000 a 3001 and then here are the ones that are listening on all addresses and that's why you saw 2280 and 9001 so we kind of know that 3000 is what's serving the port we're going to look at 3001 in a little bit but Look at this wealth of information we're able to get from a simple web shell, but we need to get our reverse shell. So, my favorite place to start looking is payload all the things, reverse shell, cheat sheet. My generic starting point is going to be a bash shell, um, but I'm not 100% sure it's running bash. So let's see if we can get it to do anything. No, the, the witch bash is not gonna help. I don't know if this is even gonna work. All right, I'm gonna to default to shell. And there's gonna be some quirks throughout this system. So we know we're 1420. I'm gonna set up this on 8888 and we'll get ourselves a shell going. With that listening, just command. I'm gonna also, like I said, I'm gonna back this up and take this down to just SH. See if this will work. Okay, we're attempting to call a nil value again. So it got a little mad. And what you're gonna see here is that it reformatted some of our commands a little bit, but not all of our commands. It's a little strange. We're gonna go ahead and go into burp, look at our HTTP history, and I'm gonna send this one to the repeater. One of the challenges in this box is HTML or URL encoding. Just to make it super plain and obvious, I'm gonna take that whole chunk that I just put in there I'm going to URL encode that whole thing. And you just go to convert selection URL, key characters, and then we'll send it. We're still getting a Lua back. It's not liking that. So we want to look at a different type of reverse shell. So you can go down, you can do a UDP. We're not going to do SOCAT. We're not going to do Perl. Uh, there's a really weird quirk about Python. You're not going to get it working on Python. But when you go down to Netcat OpenBSD, which is very similar, so this, this NetBSD, this is one that I want to try to use. Now we've still got this queued up, so I'm just going to come in here and drop it inside of our execute block. I'm going to make sure to put some double quotes back in here. 
we're going to change these to 10, 10, 10, 14, and 14.20, and 8, 8, 8, 8. Go ahead and send this. And we, this time we got a 404, so not a 500. But if we come over here, we didn't get a shell either. So we were able to clean up the error. But if I come in here, right click this, and I URL encode, and you can do key characters or you can do all. Just no problems, just say all. It comes out looking like gibberish. But we send it, and you see in this back window, we got our reverse shell. This was not the first way. I actually programmed up that Python script I was talking about first to get myself a pseudo shell. Um, but once I was able to kind of figure out that this is a URL encoding issue, it was much easier to handle. And that's because it's passing it to one page and then passing it to another. So what you'll see on some of the older Tomcats, there's, there's some, I think there's a Metasploit module for it, but you sometimes have to double encode because the first page is going to strip the URL encoding off and then it's going to pass it to the second page. And that second page is going to say, well, this isn't encoded right, and it's going to drop it and give you errors. So this is a situation where you kind of have to double encode it. So we're going to encode it first off, and now we've got a reverse shell. If I say ID, it is that dash or underscore HTTPD. And we'll look in the window, see where we're at. So there's our robots dot text. And it says weather, yada, yada, yada. If we do lslia, you're going to see there's actually an HT password file. And this is so bad, it's actually readable by anybody. You just don't know what's on the site. So if I come here and I just say weather dot HT password. No? Maybe it's all the way back. All right, so it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. It does look like it's readable. It is definitely readable by us now that we're on the box. So cat dot ht password, and we're going to see that we have a user, which is web API underscore user, and we have a hash. I'm going to go ahead and copy these and. We'll start a new window. CD HTB and we're gonna go ahead and make their Luan. Clean this up and we're gonna nano hash. We're gonna drop this hash in here, exit out, and then we're just gonna hit it with a John. So John hash word list equals user share word list rock you and we're gonna let it run uh, this one is still in my system so I'm gonna do it real quick I'm just gonna remove uh, my dot John john.pot. If you ever have any passwords that you've already cracked and you need to reshow them, it's all sitting inside of your john.pot. So I'm just going to remove that and run it again. You're going to see it cracked it really fast and it came out, I am the best. It's a very lame password, but it says, I am the best. So now I've got a password, but I'm, I'm not sure what to do with this. If we rewind all the way to the back, at the beginning of this video, if we just go here to the 218 and put in a pass or put this in, it asked us for a password. So if I say web API underscore user and I say I am the best, it just, it just tells us what we've already found out. Um, but it does let us into the system a little bit so that we can see that. There's still got to be something I can do with this password, but 
you really don't know what you can do with this password yet. We did the net stat. We know that we have a 3001. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. We'll go back into here. Here's our shell. So if I do a curl on localhost 3001, you're going to see that we got a 401 unauthorized, no authorization when we try to access 3001. Okay. Well, this might be the right opportunity to use that password. Uh, can't up, so we're going to say curl. It's user, and then you go ahead and put the information in. So web API underscore API underscore user colon. I am the best. And then we'll say localhost 3001. You do that, and it gives us the same page again. We're kind of hitting a loop here, but it's not the same page. You're going to find out is it's slightly different. The one is susceptible to things that the other one was not. So if we try to run the same kind of commands with uh, reverse shells and things like that, or a uh, who am I and try and just get code execution it should not work I say should not so I'll go ahead and drop this in because we're gonna drop in some weird characters I'm gonna put them in double quotes and we'll do localhost we're gonna say 3001 weather forecast question mark city equals London and then we did a single parentheses colon uh, print parity close it out and hit it with two of those um, because I'm already running this I'm gonna run I don't know, slash We'll go with a single quote. Parity, single quote, this, uh, semicolon, tech tack, double, and it comes back and it prints it. So it's it's back to that mode where it doesn't recognize this as a separate command. It put it in and says, I just don't know what this big city is. It treats this all as a city name. And that's not what we're looking for. I can try and come in here. I can hit it with a double and then continue down. And really to hit it with a double, I kind of got to hit it with a escape character, hit it with the double, do it that time. And it's still going to come back with a double and it's going to say, I don't know what the hell is going on. And this is just, they fix the page for the most part. Uh, some of this was handled in burp suite and I'm not able to do that from where we're at right now so it's just not susceptible to it but we are able to go back and find information using the current shell that we have so if I say PS aux so this is all stuff that you would see in linpeas, linenum, all those different tools we're going to go ahead and take a look at some of the processes so there's something being run out of lib ex or libexec, uh, there's quite a few processes coming out of there. You see all the sleep and the shells and the temp. These are all the different things that I've done to this box. You see the SSH there, but you're, you're not able to see the commands. So it's a little bit of a quirk. If I run a PSA for all and then X, we'll see the executable. We see a little bit more information. So here you see the TTYs, you see that we ran a shell. Here you're seeing that on 127.001 port 3000, you're running something which looks like it's weather through this HTTPD. You're seeing my reverse shell on 8888. And you see another instance of the weather on 3000. You see there is Python, but they're running Python 3.8. If you try to say 
well, obviously which isn't working, but if you say Python 3, it does not work on here. But if you say Python 3.8, it will work. It's really annoying. But we'll keep going up and we'll see there is a 3001. But we're still not able to see it because it runs off the page. I'm going to do one more way to try and shorten it. And if you take a look, that is PID 185. We'll go ahead and do PS, P for PID 185. And then I'm going to say for the options, I just want the arguments. And so it's just going to give me this kind of chunk, but for 185. So this is the best I was able to get. And it says that it's running an HTTP daemon. UXSI, we'll take a look at that. I is the IP, capital I is the port, L is running weather, and it says home, R Michaels something. And we really hadn't looked at that, so let's cat Etsy password. Let's try space there, cat Etsy password. And you're gonna see root, Tor, a bunch of no login, kind of base model password or users. Uh, and then in the middle there, there is one user called r.michaels, uh, user 1000. He's got a K corn shell. So we know that there is an r.michaels. And we know that this is being run out of r.michaels directory. Let's take a look at the man page. So I'm going to say man, and this is the man page for the lib exec execute um, httpd. And you are going to see that the top one there is for NetBSD. So we'll take a look. And let's break down some of these things. So there's a lo little u capital X and an S. So the S forces logging to standard error. So we're not going to be able to see it. Uh, the little u trans enables the transformation of URL of the form tilde user into the directory tilde user public HTML. Okay, so that's interesting. We'll take a look at that in a second. And X enables directory indexing. So you'll be able to see if there's not a file, it's going to do an index of the directory. So let's talk about this. So by enabling the locator in the form of tilde user, it's going to allow you into their public HTML directory. So we know that this one's running till with the dash U and this is the user. So let's see if we can do something with that. We'll go back and we will, honestly, I'm gonna go back and pull that command. So it's curl user, do, 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 do. And then we're gonna stop it here. And we're gonna say tilde r.michaels. Then I'll just cut it off. When I pull that, it's gonna say, uh, here's a 302 document moved. You're actually going to want that with a slash. So we'll just close this out with a slash. And when we pull it down, what you're going to see is this is an index of R Michaels. So that directory indexing option that was on and the user option that was on got us into this directory. But what is in the directory? So you have a parent directory, double dot from 16 September 2020. And the next thing is IDRSA. So he left his, his IDRSA key on here. Well, that's just dumb. So we'll take one more step. We're gonna go ahead and go to Michaels and we're gonna say, give me that ID underscore RSA. And sure enough, we get a private key from this guy. So hopefully the formatting is good, but we'll go ahead and copy it. We went too far. Let's try that again. Go ahead and copy it. Come back over here. And I'm going to nano 
uh, ID underscore RSA. Drop it in the box, looks good. We'll go page up, that looks good. We'll close that out. Whenever you use an ID RSA, you're gonna chmod it to 0600, just because that is what allows you to run that key. And then we're gonna try an SSH as r.michaels at 10101018. It's gonna say denied, and then we attach the ID RSA. And welcome to NetBSD. If I say ID, we are R. Michaels in the groups user. Uh, front working directory, we're sitting in his home directory. So if we say LSLIA, there is our user.txt. So cat user.txt. So there, boom, we got our user.txt. Not too bad. Now it comes time for another, I say another bit of a boo moment. I had this last time when it came down to you just had to you had to know what to look for and I was looking at the processes a little bit deeper than most people um, but when it comes to how to how to get this next step finding the file is not hard but understanding what to do is so if I go and I start looking in folders we know that the public HTML this one right here is gonna have the RSA key, because that was what was in that folder. If I do an LS LIA of the public, there is an HT password in there. Cat, um, was it public? Uh, dot HT password. What you're gonna see is this is the same HT password as the other one. So not worth the time, but that's another function of just having the, the access and having the right password that we got from the first leg got us into the second leg. Without that password, we wouldn't have been able to see the ID RSA key. So we're still sitting here. We got a couple folders. We got devil development. We got backups. So if I go to CD devil, I'm gonna do an LSLIAR, so it's gonna look for all hidden files and it's going to go recursively. You're gonna see inside that directory is web API and dub dub dub. There's a weather.lua, so that is the file that we we're able to take advantage of. Here's that HT password again. And index.html, which told us how to put in the commands. If I say cat dub dub dub, the HT password still the same password. It's the same hash and Zyco. It's a dollar one dollar BB. So this is all the same HT passwords. If I come back, let's take a look at backups. We have Devil Backup. It's a tar. GZ encoded or encrypted. The easiest way to do this is to run OpenSSL and break it down. But to do that, you would need to know a password. I don't know the password. I could try a password, but it's not actually going to get us there. If I say um, uh, decrypt a uh, dot tar dot gz dot enc the generic answers are all going to be kind of the same they're going to tell you to run this open ssl aes 256 cvc dash d for decryption dash in for in file dash out for out file completely normal if i try and run that i don't know if open ssl is even installed but if i try to run this I say devil encoded. Oh, it doesn't let me delete. That's weird. But I can backspace. And then here we'll just say temp uh, out dot tar dot gz. We'll come back down here. Delete this whole thing up to here. And we say this gonna ask for the password. I can say I am the best 
bad magic number does not work. That's the only password we know because we got into this user using his IDR say key. So now we're going to find a different way in. This was another reason the box got such a bad rating. What we're looking for is a net PGP for a tar.gz dot ENC. So you're going to be able to look at this and it's going to be for signing verification encryption decryption utility inside of NetBSD. It's just PGP keyring. So it's already loaded up in the system. The user already has his password in there. So it's really just a matter of net PGP decrypt dash dash output equals file name. And then for the input file is at the very end. So if we say net PGP, when I say dash dash decrypt, uh, dash dash out file, output equals temp uh, parity dot tar dot gz, and then the in is going to be this devil. This time you can see that it opened it up, it said, hey, uh, here's your signature, 2048 RSA key. I was able to open it up with a fingerprint and it was r.michaels at localhost. So kind of annoying, but it works. If we go into temp and we do an LS real quick, we're going to see it. They do delete things. There's a cleanup script, so you do have to move a little quick. You can see that this out.targz that I tried to run first came back with zero, there's no data. This time we were able to unlock it. Only R. Michaels can look at it, but it has got some data on there, 1639. So we will tar uh, xzf this parity file. We're gonna open it up. If I do an lsla, you're now gonna see that there is a directory in here called devil with that name, so cd devil ls we'll do the same thing ls liar inside this folder was dub 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 and the web api same thing we've been seeing there is dot there's a weather dot lua right here inside dub 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 is index.html and a dot ht password the reason I say this, if I do a cat dub 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 dot ht password, I'm afraid that we might have lost it already. Yeah, it just deleted it on me because I lost my autocomplete. So where am I? Okay. So we'll go back to temp. And we just gotta be a, a little bit faster when we get to this point, but we'll rerun. Oh, it's not gonna let me rerun that command. Fantastic. Net PGP decrypt output equals temp. And we'll say parity again. So parity dot tar dot gz and this was in our backups devil. Got it right here. Tar XCF parity CD devil CD dub 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 ls and we'll cat ht password. And this time you're going to see that we have a dollar one dollar six XC ends in HDU dot. So if we take this. We copy it back over. Uh, these are both SSH, so we'll come here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and clear the screen. CDHTB, LUAN, nano hash two. We're going to drop this one in. We'll run that same John command with hash two wordless equals 
user share wordless rock you. And when we run it, this time you're going to see that there was a previous password called little bear. So little bear is our new password. If we come over here, if I say sudo tech L, I don't have sudo. If I go to a shell because I'm sitting in a corn, if I do sudo tech L, still not found. Um, it's really challenging. If I try this one, let's do sshr.michaels at 10, 10, 10, 2, 18. You know what? It's not going to work either because it already said it will only take a public key. So we're trying to figure out what we can do here. If I say sue, that'd normally be sue root, it's going to tell me. I'm sorry, you are not listed in the correct secondary group to sue to root. I can't really, I mean, I could try and sue to r.michaels, but it's going to be like, you're, you're confusing as all get out. Uh, and I think it might have actually done it. Yeah, it just keeps kicking me into shells because it's like, sure, that sounds great. You're already using the right password or you're at least validated as the right user. You can do this. So I'm kind of stuck. I can't sudo. I can't sue. You know, you go ahead and you look online. And this is kind of the command you want to copy and paste. You just drop this in. Google that. Nope. Google that. That's not what I wanted to Google. If I drop this in, there's a lot of other people that have kind of had this problem before. Um, some of these are a little bit different. But you're going to have to find a way to do it without being in the wheel group. And this was another one of those points where you just kind of sat here trying to figure it out trying to Google the right things without wheel, whatever. There's a lot of people saying with wheel. Um, you can do all this. Um, and people are gonna give all these little backdoor ways of going around it, but none of them really work because this is NetBSD. It's a little bit more secure. There is a function called do as. So do as executes commands as another user. Do as utility executes given command as another user. The command argument is mandatory. So for this one, you would just say tack u for user. And the default is root. So you don't even really need to say root. Um, but it did say see also sue. So if you were to say man sue, okay, there's not a not a man for sue help it does not give you the information that we're looking for so you have to look it up online they really kind of lock this one away in a weird spot but this is kind of one of those things if you're familiar with openbsd and netbsd you know that 5.8 is when they added do as so it's kind of a fairly semi-recent thing this all came right here we're sitting at bsd 9 2016 so maybe not as recent as you th as I thought. But if I do as, and I just say uh, shell. If I put in the password little bear, drop me in a shell as root. So that was just kind of a wonky way of getting around it. It was more of an annoyance. It wasn't necessary. I don't think there was a whole lot of value added. A little bit, but not a whole lot. So can't figure out where we're at right now, so let's just go ahead and cd to root, lsla. You're going to see that cleanup script that I was talking about that comes around every couple seconds. We're going to cat the root.txt. And we're done. So I did go through it pretty fast. A lot of these were kind of just rabbit holes or like pitfalls. You're stuck there 
can't go anywhere else, but it is the right place you need to be. You just don't understand where to go. So if you had any struggles with this, I am sorry. I hope you enjoyed this video and you were able to get a lot out of it. Like I said, it didn't take a lot. You need to have some browser skills, some burp skills, a little bit of John, a little bit of GoBuster. You needed to know a little bit of the shell but nothing significantly difficult. It was more just finding the things in the little nitnoid nuances that you needed to get to. But with that, we were able to use Lua to pivot into a foothold. And the foothold just helped us get to that net PGP, get to the do as, and finally get to root. So appreciate you guys sticking around. If you notice, my slides are a little bit different this week. You look at the bottom of the slide right there, boom. I knocked out my G pen this last week, so another cert to go on to that. And so I switched over for my sand stuff. I'm gonna be using logos from now on. And hopefully we'll just keep adding to that list. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, I do say stick around, subscribe to the channel because I will be coming out with a video here in a couple of days where I'm gonna show and truly break down how I made my web shell for this. And it is a must see if you're gonna be going on to those web app pen testing because you're gonna have to build your own shells all the time. So, thank you for your time. Hope to see you guys again next week. Have a great week. Go learn some great stuff. Mm -hmm.